Hello, everyone. Welcome to our roundtable on publishing French and Francophone history in a global age. I'm Carol Harrison. I'm professor of history at the University of South Carolina, and I'm co-editor of French Historical Studies, the Journal of the Society for French Historical Studies. And I'll be announcing our speakers today, and then I will be moderating our discussion. Before I do any of that, however, I have the pleasure of thanking the organizing team from Auckland, who assembled such a wonderful conference, and who then took it all apart and reassembled it <laughs> online so that we can enjoy each other's company and insights today. So thanks so much to Kirsty, to Tracy, and to Joe. Uh, thanks are also due to the team at H France that is making this event happen online. Thanks very much, David, and also a special thanks to Maureen McLeod. Maureen is, in fact, pulling all of the strings behind the scenes today to make the session happen. Now, the participants in our roundtable today are all involved in publishing our English language research in <coughs> French history, and they all face a set of common challenges that they will be addressing today. COVID is one of those challenges, of course, but there are other longer term challenges that they had in mind when we proposed this panel originally. These challenges relate especially to globalization, both the globalization of our subject matter and of our scholarly community. What role is there in the contemporary world for nationally based publishing outlets like the ones we have represented here today. So let me introduce our speakers. I'll start with my colleague, Catherine Edwards, who's professor of history at the University of South Carolina and also co-editor of French Historical Studies. Kay is interested in popular and religious culture in early modern France, and she's currently finishing up two book projects. The first of these is Living with Ghosts, the Dead in European Society from the Black Death to the Enlightenment. And the second is The Brill Companion to the Devil and Demons. Second, we have Bryony Nelson. Bryony is a specialist in the history of crime and criminal justice in modern France and New Caledonia. She is a sessional uh, academic in the history department at the University of Sydney, where it's very early in the morning. Uh, and she's affiliated with the CNRS Lab Center for Digital Humanities and History of Justice in Paris. And since 2019, Bryony has been the editor of French History and Civilization, the peer-reviewed journal of the George Roudet Society. Then we have Julia Osman. Julia is Associate Professor of History at Mississippi State University, and she is co-editor of the Journal of the Western Society for French History, along with Bethany Keenan and Sarah Schertz. Julia's research focuses on the French army and its processes of reform in the 17th and 18th centuries. Uh, she's the author of Citizen Soldiers and the Key to the Bastille. And she's writing a book that is tentatively titled Writing War and Writing War. The first is with a W and the second is with an R. And Julia, this is a book that has no future in radio. Um, Disciplining <laughs> War in the Field and the Imagination from 1648 to 1750. And then finally, we have David K. Smith, who is professor of history at Eastern Illinois University. As H. France Editor-in-Chief, which is a position David has held since 2001, he has overseen the establishment of four scholarly journals and has assisted the George Roudet Society uh, in the establishment of French history and civilization. Uh, David's research focuses on late 17th and early 18th century political structures and economic policymaking. Now, in this roundtable, I'm going to ask David to open up with a brief overview of the publishing landscape and the disruptions we currently face. After that, we will then turn to each presenter to elaborate on their particular outlet's strategies for confronting these challenges. 
We'll start with Kay, French historical studies. Then we'll turn to Bryony, French history and civilization. Then to Julia for the Journal of the Western Society for French History. And then we'll come back round to David and H. France. Once each of our presenters has said their piece, then we will open the floor to questions. Uh, so let me say now a few words about how to, answer, to ask rather a question. Uh, we'll be using the chat function today to queue up our questions. So you should send your message via the chat to the host, who's identified as H. France. You can either send your question, which I will then read for you, or you can say that you would like to pose your question on screen, and in that case, we will let you know when it is your turn and we'll bring you up on screen. You can send your questions in during the individual presentations as they occur to you, or if you prefer, you can wait until the end. And we look forward to hearing from many of you and to great disruptions and epidemiological disruptions, disruptions in the forms and practices of scholarly exchange and communication, and disruptions in terms of the institutional and financial structures of scholarly publishing. And so to kick off our, con our conversation, I want to set out three key disruptions, some of which pose substantial threats to our traditional practices, and some of which are long overdue and offer opportunities for us to reshape scholarly publishing in ways that are useful and more socially just. Disruption number one, the crisis in the humanities. Now, I'm not going to try to explore all the causes of the crisis of the humanities here, but there are many. Rather, I want to set out some of the expressions of this crisis which are relevant for scholarly publishing. Looking across the academic landscape, it is not hard to find these expressions. Faculty positions are diminishing, and many recent PhDs spend years in unsecure positions with limited access for research and conference travel support. And even for those in tenure or tenure track lines, research and travel funding has often been slashed or in some cases even eliminated. Faculty in whatever type of position have produced most of the scholarship published since World War II. As publishers of content, how we seek to support the continued production of scholarship in the midst of this crisis seems a crucial question. Further, funding from government agencies seems persistently to be under threat and likely to be more so as the fiscal effects of the COVID-19 pandemic hit governments at all levels. Even some private foundations are in the process of reducing or reorganizing the funding that has often supported work in studies of the Francophone world. Disruption number two, the digital revolution. The arrival of digital technologies has profound effects on our work as producers of scholarly content. And it's probably indicative of this development that three of the four publications represented on this panel produce their materials in exclusively digital format. The digital revolution provides advantages for scholarly publishing in cost savings and in, in accessibility, especially for materials published open access. But there's always a cost in producing such scholarly materials. And central to that cost is the time, talent, and energy volunteered by dedicated people willing to sustain such enterprises. How, as a scholarly, as a community of scholars, we bear that cost. How we share it among a sufficiently large pool of scholars that it is sustainable is another crucial question. And how we bring hiring, tenure, and promotion committees to recognize the importance of this work is equally crucial. Whether we do so during our own service on these committees or in the letters we write in support of our colleagues. 
Further, the digital revolution allows us to publish for a global audience, which raises questions as mundane as whose standards to adopt for spelling and punctuation, to questions as difficult as understanding the political dynamics that shape a piece of scholarship or the interpretation of that scholarship in multiple cultures. Global scholarship paves the way for global misunderstanding. The digital revolution also allows the production of a greater range of scholarly materials that promote engagement with a broader public. Whether it be through superb sites, such as the Age of Revolutions, or pub publicly accessible databases, digital humanities is a vibrant field helping to amplify the voice of scholarship. But that publicness has its counterpart in social media. Sometimes social media by scholars, and sometimes by crazy Uncle Fred. Now, there is no value in complaining about social media or in simply ignoring it. Social media can illuminate blind spots and raise important issues, and it can be a place for ax grinding and virtue signaling. But producers of scholarly content can no longer assume that the works they produce will only be read and discussed within scholarly contexts. We need to understand the significance of that broader discourse for our work and for the engagement with the public that we hope our scholarship achieves. The last disruption I wanna highlight is very recently engaged, although long, long overdue. The establishment of inclusive, anti-racist scholarly production and of a diverse scholarly community. The emergence of the global Black Lives Matter movement, especially over the past several months, has energized a confrontation with our failure to address white supremacy, cultural dominance and privilege, as well as other forms of racism still present in scholarly publishing. Numerous questions arise that we need to address as publishers. Regarding the content of our publications, how do we configure France within a global frame that acknowledges the policies and cultures of exploitation, colonization, enslavement, and discrimination that characterized France, the French Empire, and their legacies? How do our publishing practices serve to marginalize history that is non-white or not French enough, a phrase that I have certainly heard used? Regarding editorial practices and decision-making, how do we make sure that the views and perspectives of underrepresented groups are heard and respected in determining what gets published? How do we educate and train ourselves to be more cognizant of the unrecognized biases that we as editors should address with our authors? How do we ensure that reviewers are not dismissive of new work that challenges assumptions of established scholarship? And how do we ensure that the critical comments by reviewers are justified in their assessments and articulated in appropriate language. Some of these are long-standing issues for editors, but they gain a crucial new register when considered in relationship to an anti-racist agenda. Addressing these issues will require careful attention to the thoughts and experiences of those who have been marginalized or worse, insulted in our publications. We need to learn from them how we can create a more inclusive practice of publication and a more diverse and welcoming community of scholars. We must go beyond lip service and pledges of solidarity. We must institute training, policies, and more 
Such efforts are a moral imperative when publishing in a global age. Thank you. Oops, of course, this moment is when my camera decides it's going to come unhooked. Uh, please excuse me. Um, okay. Now, better. Um, I'm coming at this from the perspective of kind of pragmatic uh, institutionalization in our journal rather than in um, a lot of the broader theoretical questions that David raises, although I'll certainly address some of those. And what I have is actually four kind of main points that I just wanted to highlight. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, uh, as many of you are aware, is point out that we are the non-purely digital or non-digital um, journal in the group. We are a much more traditional structured journal, French Historical Studies, and uh, but we do touch on the digital um, digital publishing, and we'll I'll describe that in a second. Um, I wanted to start, actually, um, I guess, to get debate going by challenging a bit of David's uh, crisis of the humanities model, um, at least as it affects uh, our publication, uh, in part because I, I wanted to, I would like to make the session um, a little less, frankly, depressing, <laughs> but also um, because both Carol and I, I don't think I'm speaking out of turn here, believe there remains a place for traditional scholarship. That is not so much traditional in terms of ideas, as David mentioned, but the traditional research single or dual authored article with extensive footnotes, detailed uh, quotations, things like that, and of a certain length. And we provide a venue for it. And our subscriptions, our, our submissions certainly haven't gone down. Neither have our overall subscriptions. Individual subscriptions tied in part to, well, the membership of the society. Yes, those are going down, as they are for journals all over. But our, uh, our kind of group joint subscriptions, our institutional subscriptions, um, those are going up. Uh, certainly, there also continues to be quite a bit of reference to articles that come out in French historical studies. So it's clear that among the academic community as a whole, this traditional format of publication still has a very definite place, um, and for which being a self-confessed archive rat, I am thrilled <laughs> because I love those really meaty articles. That being said, what it means to do French history has changed. Uh, and I, for one, as somebody who has always worked on frontiers, borderlands, and multinational history, am really thrilled with that, and I'm pleased to see at least how, how many journals are approaching this. Traditionally, it's been focused on the European framework of France, the hexagon, and when other areas come in, they tend to be about how, how this has affected the hexagon or how the hexagon's rules have affected that. There are all sorts of problems when you use these geographical parameters to just define France. Um, I think sometimes they're less obvious to people who work in modern history, but as those of us who work in pre-modern history, or certainly who work in areas outside the hexagon know, that geographic uh, division just really hasn't worked. What Carol and I tried to do from the moment we started with French historical studies was to follow a model that has developed in the past 20 years among scholars influenced by French history and by questions that, that um, have arisen from a French or a Francophone experience. 
We've tried to broaden our focus to include French controlled and French influenced territories outside of Europe and Francophone uh, interests in general. And by that, I also mean by publishing articles that have that look in these areas in their own terms. For example, so by publishing an article on I Algeria, by publishing an article on Vietnam, by publishing an article on Haiti, not French regulation of Haiti or French regulation of Vietnam. Um, there are problems and challenges to doing this that overlap quite a bit with what David has discussed already and I'm sure will come up in the course of the round of our discussions. Um, one of the things that has helped us enormously is um, digital history. And that brings me to my third point here. Um, digital history has obvious ways. It complements more traditional journals such as ourselves. On a really, you know, on a mundane level, it allows us the freedom from having to do book reviews which, and as anyone who has published a journal that has book reviews knows, can be a nightmare, <laughs> as I am sure David will collaborate or corroborate. But in any case, um, it allows us more time to focus on that, the, the detailed research um, article. But it also does it in many other ways. And even though our journal has remained traditional in some ways, we have worked to try and integrate things. Um, so, for example, I'm sure many of you have noticed at some stage a change in formatting to um, French historical studies online that gives us links in the footnotes and in the references to material that is being cited. Just the sheer availability of online articles, although as David rightly points out, in part because of the whole question of the cost of producing things. Sometimes these are behind a paywall. One of the wonderful things that also has worked is collaborations with HFRANCE, um, the HFRANCE lawns when we do special issues, things like that. And one of the things that digital history is allowing us to do, um, which I personally I'm really excited about um, is, for example, we have an issue on music forthcoming and we're going to be able to integrate music clips. Um, now that is done through the generosity, care, and work of French Historical Studies um, publisher, Duke University Press, who has been very um, enthusiastic about these initiatives. But as David rightly points out, you still have a problem with these because of the financial implications. Um, things are behind paywalls. Um, it depends on and when you're talking about the global reach of scholarship. Does a scholar have the ability to get through those paywalls? And the whole open access model, which many of you are, are very aware of, um, is a real challenge to not just traditional publishing, but I would argue to some extent to refereed publishing in general, um, because as, as Dave rightly points out, these things cost. People don't think about that, but these things cost, and they cost not just in terms of money, but they cost in terms of time. And as Dave, again, rightly points out, our current structures are not really set up for that. To go back and go to my fourth point, last point here, um, and to make it cl more clearly connected to the question of France and francophone publishing, another of the, the kind of motivations Carol and I had from the very beginning of taking French historical studies was the importance of broadening the reader, reviewer, and author base, not just the topics covered by the journal, but to make the reader, reviewer, and the author base reflect um, the territories or the peoples that have been touched by France, but also to reflect scholarship, global scholarship more broadly. 
There have been enormous benefits to this, I would argue, although the, the movement is still ongoing, as you might imagine, in things academic, getting the word out. Um, even just getting the word out that it's a dual language publication has been at times a bit of a challenge um, and is often slower. Uh, historians, we work in slower steps. Um, but there, I would argue that there have been benefits. I, I certainly have seen in the course of our articles, not only are we getting different perspectives coming in as we're getting authors from North Africa, from Asia, from Latin America. Um, but we are also getting um, different types of comments in our reviewer base, different types of way of approaching questions. There are challenges that come with that. Um, perhaps this, this is, makes me um, a little too traditional again, um, in that there are different national styles of how do you publish research articles. And we have 10 at 8 France, it tends to be the very large, very heavily detailed traditional model. And this is something that people who are publishing in a non-native language, English, and who are not familiar with the American research model, which is distinctly different, as many of you know, from some of the European research models, we get articles in that Carol and I often have to discuss and to what extent can we run this. Um, we also are dealing with questions of translation and translation of concepts as well as language. Since I've hit my 10 minutes, I'd like to stop there. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Hi, everyone. I'm zooming in from Sydney, Australia. So I, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I, um, I come to you from, the people of the um, Eora Nation. I'm on Gadigal land, so I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, David and, and now Kay have already painted with great clarity the sombre picture of the various challenges that we face as a community of scholars, but actually more broadly as human beings. Um, quite aside from our current crisis with the global pandemic, we face growing authoritarianism and human and environmental catastrophe, which gives both an urgency to everything we, that we're doing and a sense of perspective um, indeed, given everything that's going on at the moment, a conference in French history, French and Francophone history, might almost seem like a quaint distraction. Um, and there is a grain of truth to that. Um, but the very fact that we're even managing to hold a conference and to have this conversation right now speaks not only to our belief in the importance in what we do, but also to the strength of our existing networks. Um, so like Kay, I want also to recognize the, recognize the positives in our situation. Um, none of this, of course, would be possible without the internet, um, but really what has enabled us to come together are our organizations, the Society for French Historical Studies, the George Rudet Society, and H France. Um, and I say all of this because although I'm here to talk about publishing, a publication like French History and Civilization cannot be separated out from the community within which it's cultivated, produced and engaged with. And so that's the first big point I'd like to make, the importance of our community and networks. But let me say something about French history and civilization. It's the peer reviewed journal of the Rude Society. It's bilingual. It offers scholarly articles of around 6,000 words in both English and French. It's open access, hosted by H France. And I know anecdotally that hits on the articles are high, especially when compared to journals kept behind a paywall. I don't have figures uh, immediately to hand, but I think David would be able to give us some idea. Um, and if we take a glance at the journal's contents pages, we can see the wide variety of topics encompassed. Um, the journal's net is as wide as the papers presented at the Rude Society's biennial conference from which they're selected. Um, and incidentally, I'm just going to plug anyone in the audience here who has presented in the conference, please do consider developing your paper into an article and submitting it for consideration for uh, publication. I'll be sending out an, another email um, to remind you 
um, shortly. And should you choose to do so, um, you'll find yourself alongside some very well-known names. The Rude Society has always made a point of bringing international scholars to Australia or New Zealand to attend the conference. And this in turn contributes to the high quality of publications featured in French history and civilization. Now this practice of bringing international scholars to Australasia is very much in keeping with a general and long-standing approach in Australasian academia to try to find ways to connect our scholarly environment with other parts of the world. Um, to be sure, the original motivations of this could often be quite Eurocentric. Um, the idea was that Australia and New Zealand needed to be tied to Europe uh, and to a lesser extent North America uh, rather than to places like Asia. Um, but nevertheless, that drive to connect researchers separated by vast distances has provided very useful foundations into the present. And in addition, and this is also critically important, the Rude Society tries to attend to the other side of the equation, the emerging scholars. So each Rude conference provides a scholarship, the Alison Patrick Memorial Scholarship, to PhD students to help fund their travel to the conference. And this in turn ensures that French history and civilization is a platform for scholars at the start of their professional career. Uh, but I should say that these days, the idea of a professional, so-called professional career in the humanities and social sciences is becoming increasingly problematic. Uh, there are fewer and fewer jobs, especially secure ones. And this is one of the big challenges for us um, all, as we've heard. And that's really my second big point. Uh, responding honestly, responsibly and with integrity to the circumstances confronting us. This means not only asking, um, it means not asking how we can protect our terrain, but rather how we can best respond to the numerous challenges we face in ways that are generous, fair and sustainable. When the Rude Society itself was founded in the late 1970s, French history was in remarkably good shape in Australia and New Zealand in terms of representation among academic staff in university history departments. At that time, as we know, no history department worth its salt could claim to have a decent program if it didn't cover the French Revolution. Things are, of course, very different today. The way that the past is understood, the types of events seem as seen as significant and the ways that all this is study, studied have been transformed and in very useful and generative ways. And there's been quite a lot of discussion about global history taking over from nation-based histories. That's an important conversation. But I do think we also need to be honest with ourselves and acknowledge the power that French history still commands over others. The study of France and its empire, uh, these have been very prominent subjects um, and have, they've often crowded out other areas of inquiry. Um, that's not to say that what we're seeing now is some kind of poetic justice, um, but just that situations like these are not entirely new and we need to see it within the broader context. We need to acknowledge that some parts of the world have never enjoyed such strong representation in, sc in scholarly circles as our fields. Um, and as responsible scholars, to my mind, we should be thinking not just about ourselves, but also about what ground is being opened up or denied to more marginalised subjects. And that's something that David has already covered. Uh, the contraction of French history as a special, specialisation and the study of the humanities more broadly um, has significant impl implications for the viability and approach of publications like ours. It's not just about what we publish, but how we publish. With fewer people in stable academic employment, if our publications are, are to continue to uh, exist in the system of publishing where the costs of editorial labour are borne by the editors, um, these sorts of questions are sooner or later are going to have to be addressed and probably revised. Um, as Kay has said, you know, this kind of service is very time consuming um, and time does have a very different meaning for those who have steady employment and income as opposed to those who are wondering where their next paycheck will come from and indeed how much it will pay. Um, and I might say that I'm one of the many thousands um, of academics across the world who finds themselves uh, in this situation. Now, these sorts of issues, obviously not ones that we as publishers uh, can control directly, but we can respond to them constructively, responsibly and with vision. And none of this uh, is anything that we can do on our own. Um, and perhaps this online meeting can serve as an opportunity for us to work together into the future cooperatively 
uh, in our different parts of the globe and with our different types of publications to attend collectively um, to these issues. Because now really is the time for us to be looking for ways to support each other um, as scholars and to enable one another. So to, to wrap this up, it's only fitting that French history and civilization, a journal intimately tied to the legacy of the historian George Ruday, himself a pioneer in the study of the marginalized and an advocate of history from below as a methodology, should be guided by a spirit of inclusiveness, progressiveness and emancipation in the sorts of voices, perspectives and stories that, we, that get discussed within its pages. Um, and I really hope that this is something that we as a community of scholars can work towards together. Thanks. Um, hi everyone, um, my name is Julia Osman. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank David for his thoughts opening up this conversation. I think he pointed at some very crucial elements that we need to consider as we're starting to really um, interrogate the field of French history and interrogate the way that we publish things. So David, thank you for those remarks. Um, and also I would like to thank the organizers of this conference and I would like to thank everyone for including me and including the Journal of the Western Society for French History um, in this conversation. Um, within the journal we're having, uh, and within the broader Western Society for French History, we're having similar conversations. Uh, and so it's wonderful that we can kind of connect with other societies and other organizations and publications and share what we're talking about. So thank you there. Um, just so you all know, the Journal for the Western Society for French History is an online only Is that as Ryan, it is not behind a paywall. Um, you don't need to have a subscription to access it. You don't need to belong to a university that has a subscription to access it. Um, you know, anywhere you are, no matter what stage of your career or non-career that you are in, you have access to the uh, Journal of the Western Society for French uh, History. So I kind of like to say, like a good neighbor, <laughs> the Journal of the Western Society for French History is there for you. Um, uh, uh, in addition to that, however, it's also um, a peer, a uh, very, very rigorously peer-reviewed journal. Um, so uh, uh, any uh, submission that we get at the journal goes through a rigorous process um, before it hits publication. And my fellow editors, uh, Bethany Keenan and Sarah Schertz and I, uh, we work very much with the authors to make sure that the journal um, receives an article from them that is the best version of that article that it can be. So it is very rigorously peer reviewed, just as much as an article would be in a traditional print journal. Um, there was a time uh, a little earlier when the Journal for the Western Society for French History uh, was known as the Paper Proceedings for the Western Society for French History. And it used to just um, highlight the uh, uh, selection of the papers from the conference each year. Um, however, about six years ago, um, when my fellow editors and I took the helm, um, we worked to, to transform the journal into its current state, where it also accepts submissions outside of the Western Society for French History Conference and outside of the Western Society for French History. So um, we accept submissions from uh, just about anyone. We get lots of submissions from graduate students, uh, from uh, uh, you know those kind of early career professors. Uh, we also get submissions from um, uh, independent scholars, and I think we're seeing more and more independent scholars these days who have tremendous training and research and things to share, um, but maybe not the institutional home that they had maybe anticipated having. Um, and of course, we also publish a lot of things from more seasoned scholars. Uh, so in any given issue, you might see things like uh, someone's first publication, and we try very hard among the editors to be a very warm, friendly, welcoming place to publish. So we try to be very friendly, very open, very happy to explain anything and really kind of guide a first time author through the process so that it's a good process and it's a positive experience and it encourages them to, to continue their work and continue publishing. Um, on the other hand, we also get um, submissions from more seasoned scholars who want to present maybe thought pieces. Um, and just an example of that, uh, uh, very recently, uh, Lloyd Kramer, uh, published a piece in the Journal for the Western Society for French History um, called Dancing on the Volcano uh, about the crisis of the humanities within the context of French history. Um, and I, I highly recommend that you go check it out. Um, so it's the kind of journal where a lot of different conversations can take place. Um, I'll also just add that um, in terms of uh, thinking more globally um, about uh, French history and what constitutes French history and who should publish within French history, um, 
the Journal for the Western Society for French History um, has never um, highlighted a particular theme or tried to push um, a particular uh, perspective uh, within the, the articles that we receive. We're very happy to consider um, any articles that, that come across our desk. Um, rather, our focus in terms of globalization has usually been that open access piece, um, just making sure that uh, you know, and even, even in our conferences, we try to keep um, uh, the fees to attend the conference very low. We try to keep the membership fee very low um, so that as many people, especially younger scholars, um, can have access to the research and can have access to the conversations. Um, and finally, I'll just add that um, this is such a wonderful moment to have this conversation um, because uh, uh, Emily um, Marker and Christy Picicaro have been organizing uh, these types of conversations within the Western Society for French History so that we as a society can examine, you know, where have we been racist? Where have we um, uh, preferred certain types of scholarship? Where can we do better there? How can we engage more with the community? How can we kind of check ourselves? Um, so we appreciate this moment that's happening right now uh, and the work that needs to be done. And the Western Society for French History is taking it very seriously and trying to make sure that um, we are having a positive impact in this area. And I'll, I'll stop there. In considering the three issues I raised at the beginning of our session, I'd like to offer some comments on each of them in relationship to H. France. Uh, first, the crisis of the humanities certainly offers challenges. A shrinking pool of scholars of the Francophone world is a problem for an organization that relies upon a large number of volunteer editors. Because H. France operates as an open access organization, that does not charge for any of the resources it produces, we don't have a regular income flow. We're able to operate on a slim budget because of the about 100 editors who volunteer their time and talents. These volunteer editors really are H. France and everything it does. H. France provides an opportunity to draw upon the breadth of talent at many different types of institutions including institutions such as my own that would never host a conference or sponsor a journal. And in effect, H. France helps to democratize the support of the community of scholarship to which we all belong. But is this model sustainable if the crisis of the humanities becomes too severe and the pool of talent sh shrinks dramatically? That's a question I don't have an answer for, but certainly worry about. The second component of the crisis in the humanities is the financial threat. H. France keeps it co its costs very low. Last year, the year in 2019, we published hundreds of book reviews, salons, forums, uh, supported many other resources, all for a cost of just under $6,600. But that $6,600 are real costs. And when you're talking about digital media, we have to constantly prepare, be prepared for the next technological upgrade. We've met these costs through the generous donations of many of you when we hold our quadrennial fundraiser and from a small yearly grant from one foundation. But that foundation itself is having a financial crisis. Now, I don't want to be an alarmist and make it sound as if H. France is about to go under, because we're not. Our finances are in solid shape. But we must be conscious about our finances because we don't really have a wealthy, long-established organization behind us to provide a financial backdrop. Turning to the second issue, the digital revolution, H. France is in something of a unique position. We are part of the digital revolution. Our central mission is to aid the community of Francophone scholars in developing digital technologies in the promotion of scholarship. But the digital revolution moves fast, and I don't think anyone really has a clear idea of where it is, where it is going, which can make planning a challenge. Further, as an organization that began by seeking to develop the new technology of email, for scholars of French history. The practice of discussion and debate is somewhat built into our DNA, or should I say our coding. 
But as we have very recently been made aware, we cannot, nor should we try, to control how those discussions spill out of our venue and into broader social media. As H. France has busied itself with the development of digital technologies, we have not given sufficient attention to the communicative ecosystem that was developing around us. We need to learn how to better demand of ourselves in our role as editors so that we can help our members appreciate the larger world of social media into which their messages and their research may be sent. And when our discussions do spill out, we want what spills out to reflect the values of scholarship that we say we expect. That brings me to the third point. H. France certainly deserved the criticism it received a few weeks ago for the incident involving Marlene Dot's article for the History News Network. And just to give an update on that, the incident report is now with the Ad Hoc Committee on Diversity and Inclusion, which will offer its comments and recommendations on a series of proposed changes in editorial policies and practices. Since H. France's founding, we have not focused as we should have on the continuing presence in our profession and in our scholarly work of white supremacy and privilege, as well as other forms of discrimination, such as ableism, misogyny, and anti-LGBTQA rights. The failure to embrace an anti-racist agenda is particularly egregious given that the central transformation of scholarship over the past 30 years, exactly parallel to H. France's existence, has been the shift to a global frame. A frame that pushes us to challenge a history that is all white all the time. And I bear the greatest responsibility for H. France's failure to take up this issue. In the roughly 11 months remaining in my term as editor in chief, I hope to do all I can to help us address this failure. Beginning with the response of the Ad Hoc Committee on Diversity and Inclusion, we will review all of H. France's operations and implement practices and policy changes that promote anti-racism and which address other forms of discrimination. We will do so while sustaining H. France as a space in which vigorous or in which scholarship and the concerns of our profession can be vigorously debated and discussed. But we will insist that such debate be done in a manner that allows full voice and respect to those who have historically been marginalized. By the time my term comes to an end, we will have launched the process of creating in H. France a more diverse, inclusive, and just foundation from which H. France can move into its future. Thank you. Thanks very much to all of you. That was um, an interesting and really provocative and uh, set of comments. And I certainly have lots of ideas circulating now. And I know there are questions circulating in the audience because one of them is already queued up, <laughs> ready for the question and answer. So let me ask a question from Jennifer Sessions. Um, Jennifer writes, um, about the issue of the gender division of labor, and she observes that this came up in the workshop on Monday that the uh, WSFH Engagé sponsored, and it's also something that David addressed in his remarks. And Jennifer writes, looking at the lineup for this wonderful panel, I don't know whether to be inspired that women are editing so many of the journals in our field, or to worry that general editing has become a feminine ghetto. So is editing power or is it service? And I'll throw that out to you to begin with. It's both. Um, and I'm not trying to be flip. Um, it is power and there are all the ways you can exercise it are both positive and negative as David's comments very rightly suggest. Um, but it is service and I agree. I'm. I'm disturbed by it, 
by not by editing and the, the but the gender division on these things if you start looking at things like who's all, who's doing um reviews who's doing um editorial board service who's doing um there is a gender division of labor and i'm not entirely sure what can be done about that if we keep the publishing model Dave, you've got many more editors than we ever have. I mean, have you noticed the same division, Dave? Yeah, this is an issue that's, that came up, I want to say, about four or five years ago when there was a lot of discussion about the gender division of service within the profession. And I certainly had noticed that it was easier to recruit editors who represented as female than male. And yeah. I raised this question with... I. This was at uh, SFHS, I think, when it was in Washington. I was meeting with the officers for H France. So these are the editors of the various uh, uh, journals. And I raised this question to them. I said, you know, should I consciously be trying to make a point of recruiting men into some of these mm -hmm. positions? And it just so happened all of the editors there were women, and they all said unequivocally yes. That yeah in some sense need to take a responsibility not to allow service to become simply a, a, a gendered expectation, but instead we need to recruit and develop and make sure men and women are both, and, and people who identify in other ways too, are involved in this editorial process. Yeah. Um, if I can just jump into that question as well, um, uh, uh, I agree um, that yes, uh, Editing is both a service um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, a wonderful thing to do. And it's great that you can kind of, you have a hand in deciding what people are talking about. You know, you are deciding what the conversation is going to be. And largely, that's entirely dependent on who submits something to your journal. You know, but <laughs> still, you know, it's, wonder, it's wonderful to be part of the factory where the sausage is made in a way. Um, on the other hand, I think just to speak to the gendered issue, um, I, I think, it's, especially in academia still, you know, there's a certain degree to which I think men feel like they don't have to say yes to so many things and women feel like they have to take any opportunity for involvement that comes their way. And I think that's still something, um, yeah. not to further broaden our conversation, but I think that's still something that's going on more broadly within academia. So I'm very happy being an editor. I really enjoy it. I love getting to have a preview and a sneak peek at the scholarship that's coming up. Um, you know, but I think, I think the, the gender distribution that we see here on this panel uh, is indicative of broader things happening in academia. Mm -hmm. And if I could just um, add on to that, I think, you know, if you look at the longer history of editing, uh, it's well known that women have uh, undertaken that sort of often characterized as un, you know, thankless labor. Um, and I would just say that I don't find editing thankless in the slightest. I mean, with my, no. my colleagues here, we, we love it. And I also think I don't see myself as a gatekeeper um, to knowledge, but rather as a facilitator for the community of scholars that we are. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I think um, these are these are debates that we need to have. Um, but we also just need to valorize um, the service and the wonderful thing of, of, um, of being in publishing. So just to yeah. put a positive slant on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree, agree with that. I, I don't find it thankless. However, I do think it is important that we push people to rec recognize. I'm not talking about my colleagues out there who have always been very wonderful and supportive, but tenure committees, hiring committees, these committees really have to be pushed to recognize this as a scholarly contribution oh, to the yeah. life of our community. I've been very fortunate. My institution has always done that but certainly there are many institutions that don't. And also when we're editing other people's research, we're not doing our own research necessarily because that thing does take it up an awful lot of time. Um, so it's wonderful to acknowledge that, yes, but we had a part in that other research that's being produced. So. Well, and that's, I think, also part of why you get this gendered division um, that at least my personal experience is that the editing isn't recognized in anywhere the same way as um, as more traditional forms of publishing. And sad to say, what ends up happening in that situation, um, the way the classic kind of gender roles have 
have played out, I'm hoping that they will change, is that the men in at least our department have certainly felt more open to just saying no because I don't get recognition for this. And that, that very pragmatic calculation um, can play gender issues as well. Uh, Mita Chowdhury actually has a follow-up question about this quest about this issue of uh, gender and division of labor. Um, and she asks uh, if there's a gendering in terms of forums on certain books, uh, and if this pattern reflects gendered hierarchies and institutional representation. Um, who has, as Mita put it, who has the job? And to what extent do these patterns uh, then become an echo chamber of authority? Anyone wants to follow up on that? Well, I'll follow up a little bit. It's an interesting question. Uh, I know what the way in which we, H. Francis structured, there are, I think it's 18 different editors who are responsible for linking books with reviewers. So I'm hopeful, and maybe I'm naively ignorant here, that there isn't any single or, or you know, single focus that would be shaping who's being chosen to review certain books in, in some of the terms that Mita's just mentioned, simply by having a nice wide variety of people who are involved in that practice. But it is something that we do try to think about, especially with people's first books. And thinking oh, yeah. about who's going to review that book we try to give extra consideration to, recognizing that that book's often tied to tenure decisions. And you, bring, Mina, you brought up a question that I have thought a lot about for various reasons over the past year. And one of the things that does disturb me quite a bit about academic publishing, particularly at the kind of level of journals, um, is the way it can be very, um, at the risk of sounding like high school, cliquish. Um, that the same 10 or 15 cohort uh, schools and their cohort of graduate students all form little groups and one of the things I mean Carol knows pretty well and this probably get you know, I don't I think she'd be frustrated with me in this because I know she agrees with the pro that this is a problem but this is one of my pet peeves um, not having been through you know undergraduate IVs or things like that myself um, I I, I hate seeing that. And so I know, like David is talking about, we have very consciously tried to pull in. Um, part of the problem is, again, the, odd, the, the challenge always in academia of how do you find out who's doing what work. And I wish there was some way. I remember Bill Bike's wonderful list that he had many years ago. Um, that you could su subscribe to of what are you doing in French history. And I would go to that a lot to try to find people who were more junior or people who um, hadn't yet published in an area who were not as kind of promoted as the way you can be in the, let's say, top 10 or the connected programs. And um, I wish we had something like that. To we do. talk again about unrewarded service. <laughs> we do. We do. The, uh, the scholars registry that H. France put together uh, quite a while ago, people maintained their own accounts. Is it there's, still maintained? Okay. There's something around, I want to say, 900 to 1,000 scholars who have registered with it and identified themselves by their research topics and interests. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Now I know where I'm looking for stuff. <laughs> All right, well, um, we have a different question here from Brian Banks, uh, and Brian asks, what strategies would you suggest people employ to encourage t tenure and promotion committees to consider editing work as both service and scholarship? And Brian says that he has thoughts and suggestions on this, and, and I'll just add that Brian is the editor of the Age of Revolutions website, and I am confident that Brian's thoughts and suggestions are well worth listening to, um, but he'd like to hear from the panel. Well, I think number one, the responsibility resides on those of us who are serving on such committees to make sure that those issues are being addressed and dealt with. 
Uh, I've chaired our university's tenure and uh, promotion committee three different times. And in that, part of my goal has been to emphasize the range of types of service activities and its value. So I think, yeah. Brian, part of the answer to that is old farts like me have to be willing to speak or when we're writing letters from somebody, have to find ways to emphasize to committees the importance of this. Thank you, Old Fart David, for speaking on our behalf. Um, there are two <laughs> people who are willing to do that. Um, I'll also add that one thing that I've noticed at my own institution is um, in an effort to stay, I hate to use this term, relevant um, in the modern age, um, have tried to make faculty research more appealing and more accessible to the community, whoever, may, whoever the community may be. Um, and so uh, one of the things that um, the faculty at my institution are pushing for is for recognizing things like um, digital scholarship as a publication, because right now that's still considered service. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Consider um, editing work or you know, those kinds of uh, more uh, maybe accessible uh, 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 research publications as something that can get, you can get publication points for, uh, for promotion and tenure, um, because right now we're only rewarded, you know, if we publish in a very narrow journal or if we publish with a very, um, high-priced university press is kind of a sign that, like, look, we did something scholarly because no one else cares. Um, <laughs> the university is considering how to assess other forms of scholarship that isn't less rigorous just because it appeals to more people. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear Brian's responses to this. Yes, I think yeah. Brian is going to come on next. Oh, um, okay. So, uh, Brian, it's your, it's your moment in the sun. I don't see you. Um, Fudge. I think we'll get him in just a minute. Okay. There we are. Hi, Brian. Caught me in the middle of painting my daughter's bedroom, uh, which is one of the, <laughs> uh, it's one of the beauties of a digital conference, right? Is that we can multitask. <laughs> and this is me covering uh, what I fear is a lack of collegiality <laughs> or something. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm going up for my three year review this year, and then up for tenure in two years. And so this question, when I first came to Columbus State University of how to, to mobilize my experience with Age of Revolutions in a way that would benefit me professionally at my institution was constantly on my mind. Um, the answer to this has been in every single yearly uh, evaluation to make sure that my chair is pushing it as both service and scholarship, uh, to make sure that I am forefronting the work I do in as mm -hmm. many forums at the university as possible. Uh, so that it looks like the, the university has bought into what I'm doing as well, which also finding some kind of public, uh, some kind of funding through the university uh, as well. It's also meant that if you go to ageofrevolutions.com and you click on our blurbs page, you will find that we have been blurbed just like a book to make it seem it is just a book, right? We've published 400,000 words in the last um, four and a half equivalent of two very long edited collections, which would certainly count for, for tenure. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, are, I mean, there are other strategies too, but I, I do appreciate that what we really need is allies in the upper echelons of, of the tenure world, these so-called old farts, David. Um, um, and, and I think that's happening more and more and more. I know when I, came to CSU, I made it very explicit that I wanted this to count for, for more than just service to the field, and, and everybody seemed pretty, um, pretty open to that. I think that's an important point, Brian, is to make sure that your institution is going to recognize it, to have those conversations early, and it helps to find people who will champion it uh, within your department and beyond. Yeah. The other thing you could conceivably do is a lot of the, the major national organizations like the American Historical Association now actually have official statements. I'm sure you're aware of this, Brian. I'm saying this more for the general audience. Um, that's something where they're arguing for the value of digital and public history and 
that's helped with our committees a little bit, having that out there. The other major point I want to throw out there is that now Age of Revolutions is affiliated with the Consortium on the Revolutionary Era, and we are going to be publishing something that looks like the proceedings in an open access format um, to our fairly significant audience, too. Mm -hmm. That's smart. Okay. Let me, um, I'm going to take advantage of my position as moderator to shift the discussion a little bit because I have a question I want to ask. Uh, and I think what I'm trying to do is bring together the optimism that Kay expressed and I think Julia and Brian as well, but also take on uh, the disruption that David ended with, the question of how scholarship and scholarly communities can tackle questions of racism and white supremacy and making our, our, making our work more inclusive. And as I was thinking about this panel, I was remembering my very first job as a historian, which was back in the early 1990s. So before digital journals of any kind. And we were absolutely convinced that journals were dying. Right, so in my department, we were convinced that journals had no viable economic foundation or just barely, and that it was only a matter of time before they died. So I remember in my first couple of years of teaching, I used to walk from my office to my home through the university library, and I would go to the shelf and I'd pull off several copies of French historical studies and I'd just scatter them around the library on the way through because reshelving was, of course, then how people counted journal use. So I did a lot to make sure that French historical studies was really well used at the university. Um, it's hard to remember those days because journals are really not in financial crisis right now. Um, we'll set COVID aside because it's very hard to say what happens there. But the internet, the model of presses, and this is non-open access journals, but the, the model of presses bundling journals and then being able to sell them as bundles has completely transformed the economics of journal publishing. And I think in some ways made it more accessible so that even though FHS isn't open access, we participate in Duke's program to make journals available at reduced prices um, for universities that can't afford the full freight. Exactly. So mm -hmm. I think the fact that um, journal publishing is in fact pretty in pretty good economic shape is something we should acknowledge. Again, it does rely on a lot of volunteer labor, but it's worth thinking about the fact that 25 years ago, things looked pretty dire. And the second reason I think that's worth thinking about is because it suggests that journals are a place where historians really can begin to do this work that David described of decolonizing scholarship, of uprooting racism. Uh, and that's both because we're, again, we'll see what happens to university presses in the era of COVID, but we're on a reasonably firm financial footing and also because we are reasonably speedy. Uh, we're reasonably yeah. responsive. Uh, French historical studies is the dinosaur in this assembly, no question. Mm -hmm. uh, but even French historical studies, which tends to be slower than these other uh, outlets, we're a lot faster than publishing a book. And we can respond to these questions. So I, I personally find this combination of, of reasonable financial security and nimbleness to be pretty encouraging. And so um, let me throw that question out both to our speakers and, and also if anyone in the audience wants to follow up on that. Um, I would, I'd be very interested to hear it. It's interesting that you bring up, uh, well, I love the fact that you used the word nimble. Uh, we've probably all heard that administratively recently, but um, it's interesting you bring up the comparison between um, articles um, or journal-esque type of publishing and book publishing, because that's the one thing, I mean, here is this, Fran, you know, France and Francophone, you know, topics in this global age. And one thing we don't have here are books represented. And yet as historic, I mean, one of the tensions, um, and maybe this is a, is a kind of R1 or different types of universities tensions, but one of the real tensions is 
Um, simply put, in many situations, articles are not valued as highly as the book for a historian. Yet, as Carol very rightly points out, they disseminate ideas more quickly. Um, they can allow for the kind of flexibility, um, you know, that, that a monograph that has taken a decade necessarily. And there are a lot of things that would support a, a kind of move to a, a article model, although I, again, tend to be myself somewhat old-fashioned. I don't want to see us go the way of the sciences where it's cranking out volumes of articles. And I was born to be a 19th century archivist. I write multi-volume sets. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it, we haven't talked about article versus book at all. Yeah. And I think the situation is a little more problematic for at least a traditional national book. Of course, I say that there have been some great French books come out recently, or books on French history. So, David, you're unmuted. You want to take a shot, crack at that? Well, I I think I already sort of spoke a lot on that issue, so I think I'm going to leave it to my colleagues to speak on that. Can I be the, the voice of pessimism a little bit, having been <laughs> attempted to be the voice of optimism in response to Carol's point about presses not being in, in crisis? I think we need to think about why they're not in crisis. Um, that's coming largely at our expense. And also uh, there's a lot of gatekeeping. We need to keep an eye on this. There's a lot of potential gatekeeping um, with very expensive um, uh, subscriptions uh, to get mm -hmm. access to these journals they're hidden behind I mean they are bundled up so it's, it's quite a good deal if you look at it in those terms but in terms of access uh, things are being hidden away so we don't have that wonderful experience of being able to um, just disseminate as you lovely you described it beautifully Carol sort of you know leaving the the issues of the journal out there physically to be reshelved and so on we, we can't now wander into libraries and, and access these things and that's a problem and that is mm -hmm. one of the wonderful things about H France and I think one of the great virtues of um, French history and civilization that it is open access open access and so so readily accessible and there is no question of, of um, being taken over by Elsevier or any of the large um, conglomerates um, just yeah. on the question of how can we publish um, monographs perhaps as opposed to journals uh, this is just something that occurred to me as we were talking you know the 19th century was the time of the of the serialized novel that often came out in uh in chunks in in a newspaper um maybe that's something we can think about you know the sort of uh, accumulated publication I'm sorry. <laughs> Also, I think in terms of, of uh, book, I have never tried to publish a book, and I don't know very much about that publication world, but just as a reader of many books and a consumer of books, um, I uh, think that you know, they could maybe even take notes from the way that um, uh, open access uh, online journals often treat things, because you can have your layers. And here I'm borrowing a little bit from Robert Darton and the way he talked about the layers you could have with an online book. You can have your top layer, which is you know, your nice written narrative. You know, and then your footnotes are the next layer, and you could even then from there click on them and access the actual primary source that the author is citing in that moment. So I think you know if we if we learn how we know how to really make the most of the digital possibilities, um, you know, we could even kind of reorient the way that we we read books and exchange scholarship. You know, it's funny, Julia. You mentioned that that the online thing in Darton's layers. Um, I would love to know, I think in a way, the AHA's movement, their, their um, essentially sponsorship of online books um, was a little bit ahead of its time, um, although I loved it. <laughs> um, I, I would love to know how that worked out in practice in terms of people getting credit. I also know as somebody who's thought through, because I have had the luxury of being able to work at least on my big ghost book for a very long time, and have thought through the logistics of what you're talking about, to actually do that level of detailed online publishing, that's actually much harder than publishing a standard print book. Um, those link, Think about just the permissions alone with getting those links out. Um, then there's the whole question of, of the programming level. Then there's the whole question of, I, I, I would love to do this. 
I think that's the way to go. Um, perhaps I've seen too much science fiction where they just kind of go click, 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 and everything appears. Um, but I, I, I wish I could figure out a way to logistically pull it off. Yeah, a, a quick comment on that, and then I want to come back to Carol's original question. Uh, I think part of this has to be tied with the generational change. When we, yes. when H. France first started getting some ebooks, this is almost 20 years ago now, it was yes. impossible to find reviewers for them. And that matters for the publicity that a book gets and how, how it's received. So Very that's much. part of the issue. That may be changing. We're seeing some hints that a, a, a younger generation is much more comfortable with the ebook format. And if so, that's what may open it up to, to greater acceptance by the community. Uh, but I want to come a little bit back to where Carol, I think, was also pushing the, us, and that's to engage with this issue about decolonizing the types of practices that we have. Uh, and obviously, I've talked about this in my, my presentation in relationship to H. France. And, and I think, in part, this is going to take a priority of people who are in leadership positions to say this matters, and it matters not just for now, it matters for the long term success of our you know, individual disciplines or profession that we no longer have the luxury of ignoring or you know, recognizing, even saying, well, of course that's a bad thing and not finding ways to actively engage with it and to, to put under critical scrutiny our own activities. And that I think is an issue of leadership that has to consciously take the steps, hopefully take it without a crisis that develops them, but yeah. even if it is a crisis, taking them in, in serious ways that listen to the voices of those who have suffered under uh, these types of these forms of discrimination and prejudice to fully understand, because I, I can tell you honestly, I don't fully understand the types of discrimination, the types of prejudice, the types of harm that have been perpetuated. So I think it has to start with listening to those voices to then understand how to act and how to seek uh, transformations in the way we work. Mm -hmm. um, let me uh, jump in here to say that uh, Mina Chowdhury has a question that she'd like to ask on screen. So let me invite her to join us on the screen now. Hey, Mina. <laughs> Hi, can you see me? Your yep, chin. But from here down. <laughs> oh. Can you see me now? <laughs> okay, I'm in my kitchen um, now. So I, like Brian, I am multitasking. And you can also see my disgusting digs of kitchen here. Um, so I want to kind of get to this issue in terms of thinking about marginalization and inclusion in the sense that one of the things that I, I think about um, is this question of who has the authoritative voice and what gets published, you know, what constitutes yeah. the kind of topics. And we've certainly come a long way. And and I, I do believe in the peer review process because especially in this day of fake news, I think there's there are certain things, those are the kinds of standards we want to think about. But there's that fine line between that and what people deem is important, right? And what I get concerned about are, are who are the gatekeepers for that? And I think this happens more in books where publishers will send them to, to well-known academics who, again, they come from that echo chamber, you know, certain institutions, et cetera, et cetera. But that I, I think that that marginalization happens in, in multiple ways and how, you know, how does something like a, actually a French historical studies address it? You know, if H. France can move quickly but I, and, and move to a political moment as it did a few weeks ago. But I would say we always live in a, a political moment. People who want to say, oh, that's too political. You know, there's this kind of world of scholarship that's no, um, not political. I call BS on that. Um, because it really, as historians, we have to be honest that we are all in that moment. And I actually think, I think there's, there's something powerful to embracing that. And the other thing I guess I would ask is, 
in the publishing world, practically, how can we do the kind of soul searching that David is talking about? So I've thrown you with multiple, multiple questions here that I have no answer for. Well, since you specifically asked for French historical studies, and I'm sure Carol has things she could, would, could and would add, um, I can tell you that part of my, there, there are ways automatically when we review articles that we perpetuate the system. And it's both frustrating and yet I also, it, it, you know, it depends on personal knowledge. And there is a huge amount of the personal involved in editing that perhaps people don't want to acknowledge as much publicly, but of the whose opinions you respect. And that does perpetuate the system. I know that I also do a lot of work. Finding reviewers is by far the hardest part of my job, um, both because um, – you know, and I know Carol and I really try to do this. We try and get not just turned to our editorial board. Uh, as you know, you do a lot of work on that. Um, but we try not to just turn to that. Um, and I, I find myself, again, turning to anything I can find that gives me senses of people who are just publishing in this area, who are international scholars, um, who are, you know, anything I can do to break away from the old boy network. Funnily enough, it's easier for me to do that in the areas where I have less expertise. When I get something that comes in on 16th century religious history, I automatically go, oh, here is so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so who can do that. Mm -hmm. And I have to kind of go, wait a minute, you know, you don't want just to go to your old, reliable, really smart, really learned, you don't want to perpetuate the system as much. Mm -hmm. And it, it's funny how these, these tensions play out. I wish I could give you a solution. I don't have one. I think all you, you end up relying on the individual consciousness of editors. Yeah. Well, and I think I'm sorry to interrupt, but I know a public discussion like this is a first step is, is I think it is something to say, I see this and this is happening as opposed to a pretense of a kind of meritocracy of intellect. You know, this idea of educating presses, I think is a very interesting and useful one because certainly over the past 20 years, I've had to take that role with presses on a variety of issues to tell them why this or that is simply not going to work uh, in the way they want to do it. And I, I wonder, I mean, when you, talk, when you mentioned about doing it in a very public way, somebody, I think it was Dave Bell, and I'm sorry if I'm misremembering this, suggested the idea of actually having reviews written of presses, looking at their catalog, looking how it has changed over time, and having you know, a scholar or two look at that and saying, okay, what, what conclusions do we draw about this press? That that can be a way to get their attention about the ways in which they are not engaging with certain types of ideas, certain types of topics, or certain types of people. So it may be that, that expanding this discussion beyond even sort of what we're doing now, but to make presses aware that not just as we are reviewing each other, we're reviewing you too. And here's how we want you and what we expect you to be able to, to uh, do and answer. Let me jump in here, if I may, because Christy Picicaro has something to add to this discussion. And so let me invite her to join us on the screen. Hi, Christy. You need to unmute yourself. Uh, you are muted. Okay. Can't. There we go. Okay. Now I've been able to. Thank you. Uh, so first, thank you to all of our panelists today and for organizing this discussion. It's it's so critical at this juncture, um, and so thank you all very much. And thank you to those who have asked questions. Um, I just want to um, bring up a couple of things. So I've been thinking a lot about this question of education, um, and. I think that there we can conceive of very specific versions of bias training for our editors. 
Um, and, you know, implicit bias training has been around for a long time. But in fact, studies show that it doesn't really work because many of our biases are explicit. And so, for example, if we were to actually list different types of bias that are, that are very operative in these spaces, um, there can be racial and gender biases, we know those well, or, or other types of identity biases, but institutional bias. Uh, which is, you know, if this scholar uh, is at, uh, is in an Ivy League institution, then clearly they know what they're talking about. What that might mean for an editor who is reviewing, uh, um, who is editing a book review that's written by one of these scholars, of someone who's recognized as a top scholar in the field, that they might not edit that person's language as much or have the courage to come, come back and say, you know, the way you're talking about this book or about this scholar is inappropriate, or let me make a suggestion. So there are ways in which institutional bias sort of shows up in the editorial process that, that we could prepare people for. Um, disciplinary bias, that uh, it could be that historical studies uh, have an edge over literary studies, uh, or that the history of capitalism seems to have more clout and intellectual strength than Afrofeminism. Uh, we need to be ready to flatten uh, these kinds of, method, uh, of, uh, of disciplinary biases. And then methodological bias. What are the methods that are being used uh, in, in, in certain articles? Um, and and how, are, how are people maybe biased toward thinking that some are more scientific? Uh, there's been so much discussion about problems in the archive. Um, because archives are created by the colonizers and by the people in power. So the creative attempts to get around that, the, the archive and to resuscitate and recover voices that have been lost in creative ways, how do we recognize that and elevate that scholarship? These are things I think we have to teach our editors how to do and our peer reviewers how to do. Um, I also think uh, that as we move forward, in tr and this is a paradox for which I don't have an answer, uh, I agree so much with what David has said, and that has been echoed here, that we need to listen to the disaffected, to the people who have been insulted, who have given up on some of these publication venues, um, or, or are considering doing so, and try to hear what has happened. How can we respond to those concerns? And we obviously need the presence of some of these people in our teams. At the same time, we do not want to overburden people who are already stuck with cultural taxation of having to serve in this role everywhere where they sit. Um, and we also, you know, something that I've been very ner nervous about in my own leadership in this regard is what's going to happen in the discussions? Are these people who we bring in because we want to hear them in that space of listening going to be aggressed against in a microaggression or in a very sort of more openly violent way? So how can we also prepare ourselves to have fruitful discussions when we're inviting people to the table to hear them and to treat them with respect? So, you know, that's part of the sort of training and education piece. And I think that we can really come together and take some of the models of bias training, which are anti-racist rather than sort of implicit, we're, we're explicit about this stuff a lot of the time. Um, so how can we bring our, our heads together and have clear communications about these things and trainings um, happening at different levels? If, if I may jump in front of my... Go ahead. Sorry, David. I was going to jump in front of my fellow panelists um, because Alyssa Seppenwall also has a comment that she'd like to add and she was going to speak on camera. So let me invite Alyssa and, um, and then I'll turn it back to the panel. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I came on camera just to uh, be able to see Christy and echo her, but Carol asked if I had something to say and I had been tweeting. So I just want to thank you all. It's wonderful to hear all of these things. I've been more involved in Haitian Studies Association in the last six years, but I'm a former secretary of the Western. I was on the uh, FHS editorial board. Um, and I'm still involved with H. France, so I'm really happy to hear all of these things. Obviously, there was an incident last month in H. France, um, and it was stressful and upsetting, 
Um, but I'm very grateful and heartened to hear David talk about what he wants to dedicate the last 11 months of his term to doing. Um, Christy has pointed out some of the problems with having bias training. You can't just do one seminar and racism disappears. So it's something that we'll have to do <laughs> lots of work for and keep doing soul searching. Um, but as so many people have pointed out, and I also want to single out Mita in addition to Christy, because um, I'm sitting on various committees right now for SFHS or for H France thinking about these issues, and Mita and Christy both have been doing a lot of work. Um, uh, we need to think again about what are these different practices of gatekeeping and exclusion that are keeping people out. I, I made an observation today um, on Twitter. You know, SFHS has often been very white. And the thing is, I know from Haitian studies <laughs> that there are many scholars of African descent who study France and the Francophone world. So why is it that they're choosing to go to different conferences or sometimes to submit their work to other places? I think this is not just about publishing, but a larger issue. And I'm so grateful to hear all of you talking about that. And Julia, also the change to allow people to submit to what we used to call proceedings, even if they haven't come to the conference, that's also great. So I just want to thank you all for the work that you're doing today. Thanks, Alyssa. Um, can I turn this over to the panelists? Would you like to respond to Christy and Alyssa? Um, Go ahead, Julia. Okay, I would thank you. I didn't want to jump in because I think I think we all have things to say. Um, but one thing that I think is kind of coming across here is a tension that we see um, in academia in general, but especially in publishing, which is the practice of scholarship is essentially seeking approval of others, right? That's what yes. it is. And that's what climbing the academic ladder is. You want to go to a conference and you want David Bell to think, if I can pick on David, you know, you want David Bell to think you said something smart. Um, you know, I benefited tremendously from going to um, the Society for the Study of French History Conference and having both Colin Jones and David Andrus want to talk to me afterwards about my current project. Oh, you know, oh, I'm in the club now, you know. We are kind of, <laughs> the, way, the way graduate school is kind of formatted, the way academia is continuously formatted throughout your career is you're always going to be seeking the approval of others and you're always going to be seeking that legitimacy. And especially if you're kind of outside the, the bow tie, glasses, gray-haired professor type, you're going to be seeking legitimacy from those people, from David and, and, and you know, folks who are higher up on the ladder. So I think what um, Christy and Alyssa are pointing out is that we need to rethink where legitimacy comes from, you know, within the scholarly community. You know, who's, oh, I liked your paper, you know, is going to count, you know, and I think a lot of times I speak for myself, I can tell stories on myself of purposely, um, especially in the field of military history, you know, kind of, you know, positioning myself in certain ways and positioning scholarship in certain ways so that those males in military history would find my work good and therefore find my All of us on the epidemiological disorder.